What was the most underrated tank of the German Panzerwaffe in the Second World War? It clearly wasn't the Königstiger, which was likely the most overrated tank. Nor the Panzer IV, which is considered the workers of the German armored forces by many. The Tiger and the Panther are also quite well represented all over the place. Similarly, the Panzer III gets its fair share of representation as well. Which leaves us with the Panzerkampfwagen I and II. Of those two Panzerkampfwagen, one is generally considered the most lackluster. Additionally, even among contemporaries, it was seen as best a mediocre tank and usually the rating was and is far less favorable in both pre-war and post-war assessments. And if we look at the bigger picture, like the historical context and less the technical limitations, it becomes rather apparent how important the Panzerkampfwagen I was for development of the German Panzer arm and that it was clearly underrated for the role it played. Now let's start with the pre-war assessment. There were basically two factions within the German army when it came to rearmament. There was one that wanted a very fast rearmament, who opted for the Panzer I, since they wanted as many Panzers as soon as possible. The best known man of this faction was Heinz Guderian, who is often regarded as the father of the Panzerwaffe. Now the other side wanted a thorough and gradual expansion of the German army. One of the representatives of this side is General Ludwig Beck. He insisted that the majority of the tanks should be the Panzerkampfwagen free, since it had an anti-tank gun and tank versus tank combat was assumed to be one of the three main tasks the Panzers should be able to perform. Beck considered such an armament of machine gun only to be inadequate. In addition, he recalled the three tasks of the tanks, which he saw in support of the infantry, in the operational use and in the anti-tank role. However, a machine gun tank would not be sufficient either for operational or anti-tank role. The general staff therefore demanded to equip the mass of the armored forces with the medium type 3 with 3.7 cm cannon. These assessments by Beck were soon confirmed by the experience of the Germans when they sent around 70 Panzers to Spain during the Spanish Civil War. There were several issues with the Panzer I, like the overheating of the engine, many instances of detracking, vulnerable vision slits, and the vulnerability of the Panzer against armor-piercing rifle caliber ammunition, yet not regular rifle ammunition. It was especially outclassed by the Soviet T-26 with its 45mm gun that could easily pick off Panzers at long range, where they could do nothing with the twin machine guns. These observations were also confirmed by the Soviets, who evaluated the captured Panzer I, something Peter from Tank Archives and I discuss in this video on my second channel. Furthermore, the French also took notice and likely felt quite relieved. In January 1937, for example, a report in the Chamber of Deputies ruled that French superiority in tank weapons was thus proven. The light German tanks had been perforated like sieves, because the Germans had sacrificed protection over speed. Of course, this was just the press, but intelligence reports also indicated that the Allies downgraded the threat of the German panzers. Well, we all know how that ended. And this brings us to an interesting point, because just looking at the Spanish Civil War experience without accounting for the specific circumstances there is very misleading in many ways. First, the number of tanks was low, as such they were only deployed in company size or smaller. Second, there was little to no combined arms warfare and the panzers acted mainly as infantry support. Third, the panzers were mostly crewed by Spanish personnel, which was less trained than their German counterparts. And fourth, the terrain was often unsuited, as such the relatively high speed of the panzers had little effect. And finally, they were often used for unsuited tasks. As shown in the original reports, these were merely small actions in which a few panzers were misemployed as mobile armored machine guns attacking defended towns and cities. This hardly qualifies as a test of panzers concentrated in a division and properly employed in a combined arms strategic campaign. So the panzers themselves were rather weak, but the strength often came from the Germans being well versed in combined arms warfare. A crucial point that helps explain the performance of the Wehrmacht in those years 1939 to 1942 is the emphasis placed on combined arms. Unlike some other armies, the Wehrmacht High Command was wary of the belief that a single type of weapon could bring about the decision. As such, motorized infantry, artillery, anti-tank guns, recon elements, flak, Combat engineers and the Luftwaffe would support the Panzers. This would often lessen the various flaws of the Panzers. Yet during the Spanish Civil War, these supportive arms were either completely missing or usually not fighting alongside the Panzers. 
So the key lesson here is simple. Combined arms warfare is good for you, just like Quake is for everyone. Another issue is, as much as the Panzer I failed in the Spanish Civil War, there was not a real alternative to send to Spain, since the other Panzers were only available in limited numbers and too important to lose. If you want to learn more about the German experience in Spain with Panzers, be sure to check out this video on my second channel. Furthermore, it is also important to point out that the Panzerkampfwagen 1 was not a training tank that then was pushed into combat. This myth likely stems from Guderian's memoirs, which is a well-known spawn point for World War II myths. Sadly back then, spawn killing was not in fashion. But I digress. Anyway, at closer examination, the assertion that the Panzer 1 was a training tank makes little sense, as Jens and Doyle point out. While General Guderian called them training tanks in his post-war memoirs, that is not what he wrote in 1937. The Panzerkampfwagen 1 was obviously intended for combat. Why else were they all produced with very expensive nickel enriched armor plate and armed with two instead of one machine guns? These aren't needed for driver's training. And to add an additional nail to the training tank myth, there was a special training variant of the Panzer 1 with no turret. So unlike you're the head of the department of redundancy department, it makes little sense to create a training variant of a training tank. But now let's look at a more current assessment. We have the tendency to compare individual tanks with each other, which from a technical standpoint is not necessarily wrong and with proper context can provide some interesting insights. Although in general during the second world war tank versus tank battles were rather rare. And yes, the Panzer 1 is quite cute if you sit in the S35 Samoa, a tank I discussed recently on my second channel. But if you're an infantryman, well you're just a squishy thing outside of the steel box. This became rather apparent to me when I stood in front of the Panzer 1 in the Deutsche Panzermuseum Munster in December 2018. Although the tank is small, cute, underarmed, underprotected and mediocre at first. It is actually quite formidable if you put it in the correct historical context. Thus, let's go back to 1939-1940. So unless random number generator Jesus was on your side, you were a rifleman with a bolt action rifle. As you can see a Panzer 1 now, go figure out how to put it out of action. Even under the very favorable assumption that you could get that close to it, how would you penetrate the face hardened steel plates? You need to remember that these things came in packs of 5 and they were usually moving. So even if you manage to climb up on one, you will likely fall off once it moves over terrain or some of his buddies will dispatch of you with their machine guns. Not to mention the supporting infantry and the other supporting arms. Additionally, you need to consider that even as an officer, your knowledge of the Panzer 1 or tanks in general was very limited. You likely never saw a Panzer or a tank in action before. Maybe not even on photos. There was no internet, no Wikipedia, books on tanks were rather rare and you likely grew up as a farmer anyway. Or at least in a rural area. In other words, this was just a loud, dangerous, fast moving and basically arcane machine to you. And if you think this is an exaggeration, I of course have a quote for you, and not just from the early war, but from late 1942 on the experience gathered by the German Panzer forces fighting together with regular infantry in the Battle of Stalingrad. The conclusion is that the infantry made impossible demands and that it was demanded that at least the infantry leaders should know the limits of the tanks. Yes, regular German infantrymen in late 1942 had very limited knowledge of what their own tanks could do or not do. Now figure out how much a Polish, Dutch, British, Belgian, Danish, Norwegian or French soldier would know about a Panzer in 1949 and 1940. Remember, while the Panzerkampfwagen 1 did not have an armor defeating weapon, it was still very effective in destroying soft targets. At this time, the Panzerkampfwagen 1 with its twin MG-13K machine guns had a distinctive advantage over the Panzerkampfwagen 2, 3 and 4 with MG-34 machine guns, which frequently jammed. To conclude, on a tactical-technical evaluation, the Panzerkampfwagen 1 would clearly fail against the majority of early war tanks. Yet by looking at the larger context of the early Panzerwaffe and its development, the Panzer 1 played a crucial role that could not have been provided by another tank in the same time span. Since the Panzer I was crucial in building up the first Panzer divisions, the development of doctrine and the collection of experience in peacetime, yet also during wartime in the Spanish Civil War. 
Of course, this must be seen under the context of the rapid rearmament of the German armed forces, that in many aspects focused on quantity first. Under a more conservative rearmament, as proposed by General Beck and others, the Panzer I's legacy would be far closer to its technical capabilities. It is also important to note that the impact of the Panzer I on the battlefield is mostly due to the fact that its weaknesses were lessened by the German combat capabilities, particularly in combined arms warfare and also allied incapability. Additionally, it was one of the earliest tanks that was deployed in very large numbers with popper doctrine and radios. So what the Panzer I was lacking in various aspects like armor protection and armament, it could make up in numbers and early bird bonus. It is a major mistake to belittle these light tanks armed only with machine guns by unfairly comparing them to heavier gun armed tanks produced later. These were the best tanks that current technology and limited funding could produce at the time. They were instrumental in the rapid creation, expansion and training of a tactically and technically superior armored force. Thus I think the Panzer I is the most underrated Panzer. And it is without question that it had many flaws. Yet without this little fellow, the German Panzerwaffe would have a very hard time to go to war in 1939. Big thank you here to the Panzer Museum Munster for allowing me to film there. If you like in-depth research videos like this, consider supporting me on PayPal, Subscribestar or Patreon. Special thanks to Jack for sending me books that were used yet not harmed during the making of this video. Sources are linked in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.